Hi everyone, this is lecture 5.1, Sex and Sexism. Uh, in this lecture, we will be laying the groundwork for not only this unit, but uh, we'll be laying a little bit of the groundwork for the following units. Uh, this unit uh, is largely on sex and sexism, uh, and then we will follow that with um, gender and sexuality and then trans rights issues. So. Uh, those are um, really closely related interconnected topics. Uh, so just keep that in mind uh, when, as we go here. First we'll be defining key concepts, then we'll be talking about gender and society, and then we'll talk about how sexism impacts women um, directly. And then we'll be talking about how sex sexism impacts women throughout this unit, but we'll be talking about that directly at the end of this lecture. So let's first define these terms. So uh, the terms sex and gender are often used as synonyms, but uh, sociologists and other soci social scientists um, do differentiate between these two terms. So sex refers to an individual's membership in one of two biologically distinct categories, being either male or female. That's how we usually refer to it as. Now it should be noted that there are people, um, about 0.5% of the population, who do not fall into these categories. Most of those people uh, can be classified as intersex, uh, but again, we'll talk about that uh, in another unit. Uh, but when we talk about sex, we are talking about your biology, we're talking about your physical parts. Now, gender then refers to physical, behavioral, and personality traits that a society considers normal for its male or female uh, members. Uh, sex and gender do not always line up. Uh, for the majority of people, uh, sex and gender do line up most of the time, but uh, they don't always. And um, yeah, uh, gender can often be referred to as gendered behavior or gendering. I've read uh, some uh, theoretical pieces trying to I refer to gender as a verb, um, but the key there is that gender is behavior, and we often talk about uh, a masculine to feminine behavior spectrum in this regard. Uh, so you could do relatively masculine things in the morning, let's say maybe you were oh, in a boxing match or something, right? But you are a, a dedicated parent, you can come home and take care of your kid and then you could oh do some plumbing right so you would throughout your day be going relatively masculine task relatively feminine task relatively masculine task um, but those would all be gendered behaviors and the way society structured luckily today uh, that could those behaviors could describe the behavior if either uh, the sex someone who is by sex male or female most sociologists approach the study of gender from what's known as a social constructionist perspective, i.e. we view gender as a social construct and we acknowledge the possibility that male and female categories are not the only way of classifying individuals. We'll be talking about this a little bit more detail uh, later in uh, the set of lectures, but uh, the very short and simple of it is that the way men and women behave is defined by society and it's constructed by society. It is not inherent to uh, our biology. No given, of course, there are a few caveats uh, that you know are determined by that. Namely, um, men uh, tend to be a little bit phys physically bigger, a little bit. Uh, women physically give birth, right? Uh, but really past those pretty um, basic biological functions, um, not much else is determined by our genetics. So men are cap are physically capable of taking care of children, right? Uh, women are absolutely capable of doing construction work, right? And the fact that we don't think of those things as, and we think of one being more capable than the other, speaks to the way gender is constructed in our society. 
So, sex and gender inequality can be found in all societies, past and present. Uh, there are sociological theories that attempt to explain why this inequality has persisted in contemporary societies. Uh, you can remember uh, from your Social 101 classes, you could put together yourself how a functionalist would view that, how a conflict theorist would view that, how a symbolic interactionist would view that. If you have those kind of theoretical questions, feel free to send me an email. But in this course specifically, we'll be looking at more of the phenomena and not so much that basic theoretical backing. We're going to be looking at a little more of the feminist theory here. Let's look at gender and society. So, gender role socialization is the lifelong process of learning what is expected of you in terms of being masculine or feminine, right? It's learning uh, what that social, those social constructs expect. Uh, this occurs primarily through form agents of socialization. It occurs through the family, it occurs through the schools, peers, and the media. Families are typically the primary source of socialization, and this has a great impact on gender role socializing. So, and social learning theory suggests that babies and little children learn behaviors and meanings through social interaction and internalize the ex expectations of those around them. Thus, if we bathe a baby in nothing but pink things, then that girl, I'm presuming it's a girl, will learn um, that pink is a favored color. And you would really, I have uh, two little girls, you would be shocked how that happens if you don't have girls. Um, if we say, oh, he's such a tough little guy, right? That doesn't mean anything. I mean, it, it, do, it doesn't actually describe the behavior of a baby, right? Uh, he's such a tough little guy. There's nothing tough about a person that poops in their own pants and cries every time you look at them funny, right? But these are the roles we impose on them from a very young age. Schools also socialize children into their gender roles. For instance, research shows that teachers have consistently treated boys and girls differently. Um, this may uh, teach children that there are different expectations of them based on their sex. So uh, when this phenomena was first identified in the 1970s, uh, there was an absolute uh, and really obvious, based on the data, uh, disparity between uh, teachers uh, praising boys more for their math uh, prowess and science as opposed to girls. And later studies showed that girls do get praised in a compensated kind of way for their behavior in uh, the arts, uh, a little bit more in the humanities, but um, there's a difference there. Uh, in the, then, as we incorporated that into our teaching strategies, us as teachers, uh, it was found that by the 90s and early 2000s, uh, girls were being brought into uh, STEM-type fields more and more, but there is still that disparity. It still exists. It's a very real thing. Um, and it goes beyond just blatant sexism on behalf of teachers. It now at this point speaks a little bit more to uh, implicit bias like we discussed uh, when we were talking about race, right? Teachers are kind of hardwired and they don't recognize that they are praising boys more than they're praising girls and that sort of thing. Um, so there's still some way to come in that regard. In Western societies such as ours, uh, peer groups are an important agent of socialization. Uh, teens are often rewarded by peers when they conform to gender norms and stigmatized when they don't. Those teens that are most likely to be bullied are those who do not conform to gender norms, right? Uh, gender norms mean a lot to the pecking order of high schoolers, as I'm sure many of you um, are aware, having the majority of you probably have passed through this point in your life relatively recently. And finally, there's no question that sexual behavior is portrayed in a highly stereotypical manner in all forms of media, this including television, movies, magazines, video games, etc. Uh, we see from the spread of 
uh, just pictures of magazines, what we expect people to look like, right? Uh, we talk a lot about expectation of female bodies, and that's absolutely true. You only ever see skinny, fit females portrayed in the media um, in a positive way. But it, that goes furthermore into pregnancy for women. Uh, that woman uh, who's pregnant on the cover of Fit Pregnancy, um, she looks a little bit pregnant, but she doesn't look very pregnant at all. And then moving on to men, um, I certainly don't look anything like that guy, right? Uh, the vast majority of men don't have that kind of physical body structure. But um, there are models and ideals of what our body should look like and that is what's most commonly portrayed in media. Um, an ongoing um, controversy within women's studies and within sociology and discussing where does this female body image come from uh, has it's been Barbie for a long, long time. I it's my observation that a lot of this has to do with uh, history, right? So Barbie became a really big deal at about the same time uh, we started looking at this sort of stuff, right? So feminist theory really took off around the same time as Barbie. So it's not really Barbie. It's dolls of her type. But dolls of her type may contribute to negative body image that uh, women and young girls may have, it, have of themselves, right? And here we see a classic feminist theory illustration showing that Barbie's body doesn't come anywhere close to matching what a actual healthy woman's body looks like. Uh, of particular note, uh, studies have shown that uh, women who suffer from anorexia and bulimia um, often report uh, the uh, width of Barbie's waist and the um, the large gap between Barbie's legs often uh, contributes to uh, those people's sense of body dysmorphia. Um, now, given uh, those might I mean those could be features of anyone's body, but it's that exaggerated way that it appears. Uh, and Barbie's legs in particular, that um, people with those conditions most often report um, fixating on. Frozen. Elsa. Anna. This is an example of how we are getting better with this stuff, right? The message itself in Frozen, as I'm sure any of you with young children, or maybe some of you who grew up with this movie yourself, um you notice that they do look like more realistic human beings, right? But uh, still, you see uh, what ha what is pointed out, what's sometimes called the eye-to-wrist ratio. Uh, if you look at Elsa's eyes and compare them, let's see if I can get my pointer up. Yeah, there's my pointer. Compare her eyes to her wrists there. Same thing goes with Anna. This could be said to portray a type of frailty and weakness. You do not, however, see that with, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Kristoff's eyes uh, right there, or Hans's eyes either. Um, you, um, it thus is, in a way, subtly, subconsciously portraying the men as being more physically capable and the women being a touch more frail. Um, now, that's a long way to go from the body shape issues with uh, Barbie. Uh, if you then take the next step, uh, if you know anything about Moana, uh, those dolls and that um, movie actually ha is dramatically better in terms of uh, body issues. Um, I observed that when my daughter th went through that phase. And certainly the same thing exists for men. Um, originally, in the 1950s and 60s, when we first ma started making shows about uh, superheroes, you know, uh, these these Batman and Superman, they um, they look chubby almost, don't they? Um, but George Reeve, the original TV Superman, he was a bodybuilder. He his body was the ideal type of what a man should look like. Uh, but now our superheroes. They have these very uh, apparently uh, tight form-fitting features, and we know 
as adults we know that this is plastic right and this probably is plastic too and this is what isn't what people look like but to the psyches of the children that are seeing what they might look like as adults right and same goes for males and females these kind of exaggerated features um, could contribute to uh, any range of body dysmorphia issues is, which are issues where um, individuals uh, have different expectations of their bodies than is actual reality. So let's talk a touch about how women are impacted specifically by sexism. Uh, women are disadvantaged in institutional settings in our society. This means that women tend to do a disproportionate amount of the housework in a home. They tend to earn less on average than their male peers at work. And they tend to be more likely to live in poverty. Um, if this were a paper, I absolutely uh, would cite and give profuse sources on that. And I can provide a variety of uh, data to show that. Um, but at, at this point, please just believe me and I'm willing to back that up if you need me to. Uh, here is uh, one example of a pretty good source. Um, here we see hourly earnings for men and women by education level from 1973 to 2005. Uh, 1973 being when women first started entering the workforce in an appreciable way. And you see that uh, pretty steadily across most boards, women's rate wages have gone up. Uh, and this is adjusted by inflation, by the way, if you were wondering. Uh, you will note that men's wages for less than a high school diploma have gone down, as have uh, high school diploma for men, but uh, women's rates went up um, a little bit. You will notice uh, that across the board, uh, women it appears that the more education they get uh, they get the better they get paid you will also appreciate a uh, notice that the more education a man get the the more they get paid uh, however you will also notice that how much uh, and how beneficial that difference is in the far most right hand column uh, that doesn't quite work as well for women regarding advanced degrees. Um, if this were an in-person class, I'd ask you, well, why do you think? But this isn't, so I'll just tell you. Um, women tend to get different types of advanced degrees than men. And why do they do this? Well, because that these are the professions that women are encouraged to go into, and men are encouraged to go into. This is what they wanted to grow up to be, right? So, uh, grow up to be social work. My wife is a social worker or nurses uh, or something like that while men might be encouraged to go into business or to uh, become a surgeon or something like that and certainly there are uh, ladies who are surgeons right certainly there are male nurses but these are the trends in society and not everybody certainly most people don't buck trends right um, so yeah, this is just interesting data. And that's from 2007. Um, I wouldn't expect it to have changed. It might have changed slightly since then, uh, but I don't expect it to change too much since then. Um, 10 years can be a long time, but uh, not regarding this phenomenon. So this phenomena of women making less is often referred to as the feminization of poverty. Uh, which is an economic trend showing that women are more likely than men to live in poverty. And this is due to that gender gap in wages. It's due to a higher proportionate of single mo mothers compared to single fathers. Uh, when family units break up like that, uh, it is more common for uh, children to go with the mother. Um, that is for social reasons, possibly. Uh, it could be, it is because men are tend to leave their families uh, in an abrupt sort of way more often than women do. Um, but part of that 
uh, some of you may be thinking, is because the um, the court systems do tend to give custody to women more often than men. That is tied to, again, our perceptions of gender that we perceive women as being better caregivers. Um, and then, though, you compile that with the increasing cost of child care, um, and you have women who have to pay that amount of money, and uh, we see women as the ones who take care of children, and if a ch father uh, does fail to provide for his children, either th willingly or through uh, child support, uh, then um, we get that sort of phenomenon. The second shift is another, it's not an economic phenomena in the strictest sense of the term. It is more about unpaid housework and childcare that often is expected of women even after she has completed a day of paid labor outside of the home. This is definitely a phenomena of post 1980s America, right? So um, in heterosexual couples, a trend has been shown to continue even if the couple is ideologically opposed to, to the concept of women doing all the housework. Um, so prior to the 1980s, women weren't commonly in the workforce, but now, then and now, they are. Um, but if expectations of women doing all the housework don't change, then you find yourself as a woman having to work at eight hours a day and then come home and do another shift of work after that eight hours a day. This phenomena though can be minimized. Um, as I just mentioned, uh, it really doesn't matter if the couple thinks that women shouldn't um, ideologically do all the work, but if they delegate tasks, right? So what I'm telling you is you don't want this to happen in your home if you are a uh, in a home with a uh, man and woman or men and women living together, um, you have to delegate tasks to make this not happen, right? You need a chore wheel. You need a uh, chart. You need something like that uh, to say, you do this and I'll do this. And then that will uh, create that kind of balance. Um, but it's not just enough to believe it, it because these behaviors are so deeply ingrained in our brains. Uh, even our language and vocabulary tend to reflect a hierarchical system of gender inequality. Uh, this is often easier to identify in other la non-English languages. Uh, languages such as Spanish, French, uh, I'm familiar with Russian, uh, I don't know if it exists in German, uh, but other lang and many other languages. They have uh, gendered pronoun tenses, right? Uh, so... Uh, a word, the word for basketball, say, might be female. The word for dog might be uh, female. Uh, in Russian, I can speak to because I studied Russian. Um, domestic items tend to uh, be of female status, while items related with war and business are of male uh, status. Um, this, and this is also pre present in the English language. Uh, sometimes vehicles are referred to as she... Uh, inanimate objects being referred to as she. Uh, we see this in our curse words, right? Uh, to call a woman a bitch means one thing. It means something about her being stubborn and her asserting herself. To talk, call a man a bitch means almost the opposite of that thing. And there are many other more colorful examples uh, you can use there as well. Okay, that is our first lecture in this series. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, this is a the beginning of a very um, interesting topic, and I look forward to talking to you about it.